Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew in the 25th chapter. As we read verses 31 through 46, this is the, uh, the end of this chapter that we have been in for several weeks and also the end of our time in Matthew for now as Christ the King Sunday is the last Sunday in the church year. And next Sunday we begin Advent, which is the new year for the church. So let us attend to God's word for us on this Christ the King Sunday. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will, will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts and our minds, may they be acceptable in your sight. For you are our God. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. Amen. So Lee, Lee and I, not too long ago, watched a uh, television series called The Queen's Gambit, based on a book. It's about a young chess player as she uh, learns to play chess and eventually becomes a, uh, a world champion. And it's got some uh, parts that would make it maybe not appropriate to watch with your kids. But as a, a story about what goes on in the world of chess, it was fascinating. I don't know how many of you are chess players, how many of you at least have, have played once or twice, know something about the game. Normally I'd ask you to raise your hands, but since most of you are uh, on the other side of the camera from me, I can't see you raise your hands, but I trust that there are quite a few of you who knows something about chess, probably more than me. I was never much of a chess player. I never could really see the whole, uh, the whole game together. I was always just looking at one move and maybe the next. But if you're a chess player, you know that, that chess is not just individual moves, it's the whole thing. There's a, an opening game, a middle game, and an end game. 
And what happens in that opening game, of course, has, has major influence on what's done in the middle. Okay? But it even determines, in a great extent, what happens in the end game. It's all like, like one interwoven story. Our reading today is looking at the end game of God's story. That story that opened in Eden with Adam and Eve eating of the fruit of the, of the tree that God told them not to eat from. It goes through this, this middle game as God calls Abram and and then forms a people for himself, the nation of Israel. And then into the end game, with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with his ministry on earth and ascension into heaven, and his promise that he is coming again. And it is this very end game that we read about here where we're told that the Son of Man will come in his glory with all his angels and he will sit on a glorious throne. He will come again as our king. And the thing about kings in the ancient world is people understood that a king was not just a a ruler, not just somebody who established laws and raised an army and things of that sort. But the king was also the judge. The king was the one who decided cases within the kingdom. If there were uh, disagreements between individuals or between clans or between cities, it would be brought to the king to decide. And that is the kind of scene we see here in this parable. Jesus, our king, returns And he sits on his glorious throne, but that throne is not just a sign of his authority and wisdom and power, which of course it is, but it is also the judgment seat from which he makes determinations, from which he makes judgments. And in that end game, we're told that he is going to separate the sheep and the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. And the thing that's interesting is that the sheep and the goats, they're playing out their end game too. It's interesting to me that the, the, the righteous, the sheep, they have no idea that they're sheep. Okay? They don't know that they're righteous. Okay? They do what they do not to gain favor, but because that's who they are. They are good to others, not because they know that, oh, this might be Jesus, and if I don't do it, I'm going to get in trouble. They do it because they are righteous, because that is the goodness in their hearts. And because of that, they find out that what they've really been doing in serving others is they've been serving Jesus. That idea of loving God and loving neighbor comes together here as we find that that in our neighbor, we see Jesus. But the goats, the goats look at it differently. Jesus says, says to them, well, you didn't help me. You didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't give me something to drink when I was thirsty. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. You didn't welcome me when I was a stranger coming to your door. And they, they try to argue with him. They play out their end game in disagreement, saying, well, you know, we, we didn't know it was you. If we'd known it was you, we would have been different. We would have done things differently. By saying they didn't recognize him, they're making an excuse because they see doing these things only as a way to move themselves forward. They would serve Jesus because it would would put them in a better place. But because their hearts are not righteous, they don't recognize that the way they treat others is the way they treat Jesus. 
And the result's not pretty. That unrighteousness in their heart, that that lack of of a love of justice and caring, sends them away from Jesus' presence. And the thing that's fascinating to me about this, this end game we see play out yeah. is that it was fully dependent on the opening game. Yeah. Jesus says to the righteous, he says, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. From the very beginning, from those opening moves, God had it laid out. He knew his strategy, how this game was going to go was reading uh, an article from Philip Yancey that he published in Christianity Today a while back. And Yancey, unlike me, um, is quite a chess player. He played chess when he was young. He loved learning more, reading books. In high school, he was the, the captain of their chess team. He won almost all his matches. He thought he was pretty good. And then one day, much later, he had an opportunity to interact with a chess master. Somebody who didn't only think he was good, but was recognized by everyone else as being really good. And Yancey says it was fascinating because I would make a move, you know, kind of a standard opening play, and he would respond in a fairly standard way, but, but it didn't ever work out the way I planned it. So I'd try something unorthodox, And he would respond in a way that surprised me. And throughout the game, Yancey said, I could always choose what move I was going to make. I was free to move the pieces any way I chose. But I couldn't beat him. The master controlled what was going on on that board, regardless of those free choices that Yancey made with each move. That is the way that that God's sovereignty works out in the lives of us and the lives of of these sheep, sheep like us, for whom the kingdom has been prepared from those very opening moves. And I don't know about you, but when it comes to be time to stand before the throne, I sure would like to be a sheep and not a goat to find out that as I've played out my game to the best of my ability, in spite of my ineptitude, God has brought me to his kingdom. I want to know that I, I am his. And I see that not in the acts I do per se, but in, in why I do them. All of us have opportunities to serve others, to care for those in need. And when we turn our backs because we're tired or uh, we don't see any benefit in it for us, we maybe even see sacrifice in it for us. We may not realize that we're really turning our back on Jesus. And the thing is, we don't know that we're sheep. The Holy Spirit is working in us all this time because we have chosen to follow Jesus. And the thing about not, being, not knowing for sure that we're sheep is means we don't know who the goats are either. And one of the biggest mistakes we can make is trying to figure who those goats are and pointing fingers, which is the opposite of serving those in need. It's not for us to judge. It's for the king. And the thing about Jesus returning and judging is that we know this king. You see, in chess, the most important thing is to protect the king. That's the whole point of the game. Chess comes out of a a system of thinking that recognizes when when the leader falls, when the king falls, the kingdom falls apart. 
When the queen bee is removed from a hive, the worker bees have no idea what they're doing anymore. You've got to protect the king. You've got to protect the queen bee. And you do anything to make that happen. We recognize that in in the lives around us. There's a story about uh, Winston Churchill during World War II as they were preparing for the invasion of Normandy. He said that he, he was going to watch the invasion from the bridge of a battleship in the, uh, in the English Channel. And General Dwight David Eisenhower was desperate to stop him from doing that. In, in their back and forth, Churchill wouldn't listen. And finally, Eisenhower went over his head. And he got in touch with King George VI. And the king went and told, uh, told Churchill that, you know, if it's the prime minister's duty to be there on a battleship watching this invasion, how much more is it the duty of the king to be there? So I'll go there with you. And Churchill, recognizing that he could not put his king in that kind of danger, back down. Just like in chess, we will do anything, sacrifice anything to protect our king, to protect those who are uh, in charge, who make society function, who hold us together. But the king who is returning for us doesn't ask us to give everything to protect him. He does the unthinkable, he does the opposite. He gives everything to save us. Christ comes to earth not in royal pomp, but as a little baby. He allows himself to be taken to the cross without a crown of gold and jewels, but a crown of thorns. And he pays a king's ransom for us. Us who are but pawns in the big game. Okay. You see, the, the end game isn't judged by some distant, cold, harsh ruler, but by the one who knows us and loves us and judges with, with righteousness and justice, but also with love so that we can trust that whatever the end for us or for anyone else, it will be just and it will be loving. And knowing that, we can go out and love and serve others. So let us focus on our King, not only this day as Christ the King Sunday, but always so that we can be his subjects, so that we can be his ambassadors in this world, loving others the way he has loved us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.